December 16th, 1987. Dear Diary, I'm sorry that it's a whole day later, but Mom and I had a talk in the kitchen while I did the dishes, and it lasted almost four hours. Dad came home and joined us for about 45 minutes before heading up to bed early. I guess Benjamin has him working pretty hard on some new plan. Dad just rolls his eyes when Mom and I ask how it's going. Sometimes I think that my mom and I could be the best of friends. Every once in a while I will look into her eyes and think, I wonder if mom has ever felt anything that I'm feeling. I sense that some of my experiences are ones that she would understand, but she comes from a family and a generation that doesn't really like to talk about things that make them uncomfortable. Maybe Bob makes her feel uncomfortable. Maybe Dad knows Bob, too, but Mom won't let us talk about him because it makes everyone... so upset? I don't know. I guess we had a good talk anyway, because I know she was very happy when she went up to bed. I stayed downstairs for a while, then walked outside and studied the wall Bob always climbs to get to my window. It's amazing he hasn't killed himself, or at least fallen. The nights I've snuck out, I've always had help getting down. I wonder if I could make it so that he would fall. He'd find a way up no matter what. And I still want Bobby Briggs to deliver my blow through that window. Have a quickie while my parents are asleep, or out. That's what I wanted to get back to. Bobby Briggs. We're seeing each other like guys and girls do when they're in high school. It's weird. I see Donna more now, and she's with Mike. I guess she's happy, but the two of them remind me of a chewing gum commercial or something. Happiness and ambition, athletics and academics, rah, rah, rah. Last week I went through an entire bullet of coke just trying to deal with having a burger with them after the movies. Bobby and I didn't eat. Bobby had eaten a ton of junk in the theater, and I was too high to even look at food. Donna stuffed her face, and I knew she'd pay for that and sits in the seams of her clothes when she got up the next day. I'll bet she gained five pounds. Mike is a pig. He just kept shoving fries and hamburgers into his mouth like swallowing wasn't necessary or something. I swear. I don't like the way he looks at Donna, either. I worry about her, because he seems like such an asshole thinking he's something of a superhero with his letter jacket on all the time. Shit. I don't care. Donna's smart. I just can't believe Dr. Hayward hasn't said something. So, the reason I'm saying Bobby this way, going to the movies, dinner, studying at his house, going out to the gazebo and necking, taking his father's car to the Pearl Lakes, etc., is because he finally agreed to start selling cocaine for Leo. For me. I'd been waiting for him to say he would, but he wanted me to promise I'd act like his girl again. So I do. When I want to, or when I'm out of blow. I really like Bobby, but he could never understand what happens to me sometimes. The whole reason I go out for the orgies at Leo's, the reason I let him tie me up and hit me sometimes, the whole reason, besides a strange enjoyment, is because I feel like I belong in dark places like that. I belong with sleazy men who are actually crying babies. I tease them and pretty soon they're calling me mommy and burying their heads in my lap and crying about their pain. And then I have to tell them what to do. They like it that way. I belong with them. I must, er... I wouldn't be so good at it. I'll tell them what to do to me. Order them to do it. And when they do, when it's feeling nice, and I can tell that they're really trying, I start telling them what I'm feeling. How wonderful they are. How they're good, good boys. Such good boys. I tell them that mommy is happy. They love it. A child and a man, all at once. All of them, these friends of Leo's and Jacques, who I must tell you about, are very nice to me. 
if I ever needed help, I believe that they would be there for me. I don't know. I've been wrong before. So, Bobby sells the coke around town, and Leo sells his usual stuff to people across the border over in Canada. I always get at least an eight ball free, and then each time I see Leo, he fills my bullet or vial if I can find one. Bobby makes really good money and everybody's happy. That's the whole point of life, right? The only thing that pisses me off is that the other day when I went with Bobby to get the drug money from my safety deposit box, I wasn't going to hide thousands of dollars in my bedpost, he said that Mike was going to start helping him sell. I threw a fit and told him that if he did, and Mike ever told Donna, I would never, ever speak to him again. Donna would tell her father, I know it. I wouldn't be able to handle that. Dr. Hayward being disappointed in me. That would kill me for sure. Bobby said he wasn't sure about it yet, but I made him promise anyway, and he did. After that, we went out to the tree where the empty football is buried near Leo's house. The money and drugs are exchanged through the buried football. Leo always makes fun of Bobby for his choice of hiding places. The football hero, he calls him. Bobby is a football hero, though. At least the school thinks he is. Jacques said that he used to play football until he found out that you didn't have to ram yourself into a herd of huge guys all day to make good money. Jacques lives deep in the woods in a cabin with his bird, Waldo. Waldo has talks and has learned my name perfectly. Jacques, Jacques Renault, works across the border at a casino somewhere. He's a big, fat guy, but can really turn me on sometimes. He's the little baby, big man type, too, except that he knows a lot more about a woman's body than even Leo. I went out to Jacques by myself one night, and we got super high and played all sorts of amazing sex games with each other. It got to the point that all he had to say was, show me, little girl, show me, and I was reeling. Walder repeated almost everything we said all night into the early morning. The whole way home, I kept hearing Waldo say, Show me, show me, little girl, little girl. That was the morning I realized that the orgies of Leo took place in front of Jacques's cabin. There was the chair. I sat in it for a minute and knew. All right again soon. I have plans for the night. L. December 21st, 1987. Dear Diary, Christmas is almost here. I'm starting to look for another job, something with a real paycheck every two weeks. Real money. Mom's beginning to worry about how little I'm eating lately. I love it. I swear, I've never liked my body before. I still have nice breasts and curved hips, but no fat there like before. None of the guys I've been with have said anything but great stuff about my body. I need a job in order to have more money, and also to be able to tell mom that I ate while I was at work. I can't force another dinner down my throat like I've been doing. Leo and Jacques gave me a few issues of Flesh World magazine the other night. I opened the pages and did some of the poses for them, did some dancing, a few things for myself, and let them watch me until all three of us came together. I know it sounds dirty, but I am only doing what I am suddenly used to doing. Creating a show for other people to look at, while inside my head, I go into a dream. A whole audience, at least a hundred people. I do that because the more people there are, the more it seems like it's okay, and not a hidden or bad thing. All of the people, men and women, watch me. They watch how I move. How little sounds come out of my mouth when I begin to feel warm inside. I dream of a man or a woman, sometimes both, and how I see them in the front row, the quietest of all. Let's say it is a man for description's sake. So I come down to the level of the audience, and I'm wearing something black and see-through, and I take him by the hand and make him come onto the stage with me. He doesn't want to, but... I promise him I won't embarrass or hurt him. He believes me, and we go up into the lights. I tell everyone in whispers that this man is beautiful to me, and I tell them why. 
I describe him so that he becomes confident and aroused all at once. The audience loves him now, just like I do. I usually change the dream each time, but it always ends with me and my chosen partner making love in front of everyone. I get a high sometimes when I think that Bob will see me in this dream and realize that he should finally set me free. So I have these magazines, and people send their fantasies in sometimes and they get printed. I told Leo and Jacques the night they gave them to me and we played around about some of the fantasies I have sometimes. Both of them said that I should send one of them in, maybe more than one, and see if I can get one printed. They said that if I do, they will create the printed fantasy just the way I write it. Just the way I want it. I think I will. I like the idea of a special night, planned ahead of time, all for Laura Palmer. Maybe I'll write the fantasy in here too, so that you will know exactly what will be planned if it gets printed. I'll think about it. Some of the pictures in the magazines are so... dirty. Almost too dirty for me, but I see why some people get turned on by them. They're mostly pictures of people being being someplace or with someone who is totally a fantasy person. There's no tomorrow or yesterday. No hours or minutes or roles or parents or mornings or anything to worry about. I like that part, but some of the photos are of women being captured and taken away by these men. I don't really like those so much, because for some reason, I don't know what, they remind me too much of Bob's visits. The women are too young or innocent or something. I like being taken by someone, but I like being teased and given little dreams and ideas. I don't like fears, or lies, or yelling, and that's what some of these pictures are like. Darkness and sex is okay, as long as it's strange and mysterious darkness, and not the kind of darkness of hell or nightmares or dying. That stuff isn't for me. I like the good stuff. Almost really bad, but just teasing with the bad, not taking its hand and pulling it inside. I have to go shopping for Christmas presents tomorrow. God, I have no idea what to get for anyone. I suppose it's bad for me to wish for Coke for Christmas. A ton of white, fluffy snow all over me. More later. Laura. December 23rd, 1987. Dear Diary, Remember the night that Leo and Bobby and I went out to Lowtown to buy Coke? Remember? I stole the kilo and everything went crazy and we had to make a run for it because everyone started firing their guns. I just had a dream about it. I never even really thought about the fact that Bobby probably killed that guy when he shot him. Bobby actually shot him. And I watched and didn't even care. I think I just told myself that I was dreaming or something, but I know that's a lie. Completely. I just called Bobby at home and talked to him about it for a minute. At first he was okay, and we were trying to whisper and talk about it at the same time so that no one would hear. And he started to cry, I think. I couldn't really tell for sure, but... I think maybe he had lied to himself the way I did. I don't think either of us realized what we had done. I was on the phone in my room and I just stared at the bedpost while Bobby was silent on the other end of the line. I think I'm in over my head with the coke, but I just can't stop. It's been the only thing besides Johnny Horn and all sorts of sex that's kept me going. I wonder if the dream I had means I'm going to hell. Me and Bobby Briggs in hell side by side doing coke with the devil. I know that isn't funny. It isn't funny at all. In the dream, the guy Bobby shot stood up after the bullet went into his chest, and he said that death had given him 60 seconds to tell us our future. He said, you, with the gun, watch yourself. 
Those who die this way memorize the face of their killer and tell death about that face. Death comes looking for you, takes your friends or a parent. Death takes what you have allowed it to. Murder is just a way of shaking death's hand and telling him, what's mine is yours. In the dream, Bobby looked at me and back to the guy he shot. The guy said, you watch that girlfriend of yours. Someone down here is saving her a seat. And it was over. I told Bobby about the dream and he said he had to go. He didn't say where. He just said he had to get off the phone and go. I bought Bobby a pair of his favorite boots for Christmas. They were expensive, but I had saved a lot, believe it or not, from my sessions with Johnny. I guess I started to feel like it was bad to use that money for coke. I hadn't needed it lately because Jacques and Leo had been getting me high and playing games. I don't even have to call them anymore. Jacques calls me and if mom or dad answers, he says he's calling back about a job I applied for. I always know it's going to be a wild night when mom says that the phone's for me. Some gentleman calling about your application? <laughs> I should get a real job. Somewhere that I can dress up a little and be high and pretty and paid. Diary, I hope that my dream was just a nightmare memory, and that if the man in Lowtown is dead, that he's somewhere nice, or that at least there is no pain for him now. I'm afraid that if he had pain now, that somehow death would save a seat for me. Death would probably let Bob hold that seat. I don't want to think about that. I'm going to take a shower and do some blasts. I need to finish Donna's Christmas present. Did I tell you about it? No, I guess not. I don't see it above. Well, I was feeling like I should do something a good friend would do. I wanted to give her something that would take her mind off of all the ideas she has about how much trouble I might be in. That's my business now. I called Dr. Hayward, talked for a while, and had him sneak Donna's blue jean jacket to me when she wasn't home. I went to the craft shop in town and bought all the beads, patches, and embroidery thread colors she likes. I've been up for the past few nights sewing everything onto the jacket in neat designs. I know she's wanted to do it herself for ages, so I hope she likes this. I need her to stop worrying. It only causes trouble. See you later, diary. Love, Laura. December 23rd, 1987. Dear Diary, I finished Donna's jacket, and it's now 4.20 a.m. I can't get to sleep, and I'm thinking about going to Jacques or Leo's to get some pot, or maybe Jacques is one of those Valiums he gave me a couple of weeks ago. That was great. Maybe I'll call first. I don't want to walk through the woods without good reason. Be back in a minute. L. Back again, and so glad I didn't walk all the way out there without calling. I'm not sure if I told you about the night I got lost, and so afraid in the darkness of the woods that I just sat down and cried until the sky got light enough to find my way home. I was offered a ride home, but I was afraid that Dad would be home late, and I'd pull up with Leo or Jacques right when he got to the house. He likes his little girl the way she used to be. Maybe still should be. No. Anyway, I talked to Leo first, and he said he missed me. Shelley was back from her aunt's funeral, and the inheritance he thought she was getting never came. She might have to go back in a week, because her aunt left her a lot of the stuff. He asked if I had sent in my fantasy. I told him I was thinking of working on it, but I needed to come down a little. He laughed a little and said that Jacques had something to tell me. Jacques came on the line, and I told him I was sorry to call so late. He said he'd only be mad if I hadn't called, and then he called me his sweet baby, and I smiled but didn't say anything. He said Leo told him why I had called, but that he was already prepared for this to happen. He told me that in the bra I was wearing the other night, the white lace one, he had hidden one of my Christmas presents. I asked him to hold on so I could get it, but he said Leo needed the phone. Shelley was waiting for him to call for some from some truck stop somewhere out of state. I guess he doesn't want to be around her right now. I hung up and searched through my drawer for the bra. The white lace one is one of Jacques's favorites. 
It has a wire support and it makes my breasts look really nice. So I found the bra. Thank God I hadn't had time to do my hand washing. Inside the fabric cup, I felt a package about the size of a cigarette pack, but thinner. I'm so lucky Mom didn't find this. When I opened it, I realized that the wrapper was a folded, torn-out page from Flesh World, showing a guy built kind of like Jacques kneeling in front of a really pretty blonde girl. I think she was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen in that magazine. In the photo, the man was the girl was almost naked with the parrot on her shoulder, and the man was kissing her feet like he adored her. At the bottom of the page, Jacques had written, Thinking of you, fantasy girl. Inside, there were four Valium, two joints, a quarter gram of coke, and a silver wand. Brand new and shiny. I became so excited I almost forgot what time it was, and I heard my mom call my name to see if I was okay. I flipped all but one of the lights off in my room, shoved the packet back into the bra and slipped it under the bed. I put Donna's jacket across my lap and pretended that I had fallen asleep. A moment later, Mom came in, woke me gently, and told me to hop in bed. I was brilliant in the role of innocent sleeping daughter. I kissed her and mumbled a little, and after she left, I waited almost forty minutes before leaving the bed. I brought all of the treats up onto the comforter and played in the dark until it was safe to put a towel under the door and switch the light back on. I only used the night light because it was sexier than the bright one over my head. I went into a deep, drugged, happy, thoughtful, nasty, and still innocent fantasy. I'll have to tell more later. I feel so dreamy right now. I'm on two Valium, another line of coke, and half a joint. I splurged, but damn if I don't feel absolutely perfect. I think I'll look at Flesh World issues for a while before it gets light out. I'll either tell you the fantasy I just had, or one I get a new idea for from the magazines. Night Night, L. Christmas Eve Day, 1987 Dear Diary, I'm at the gazebo trying to get the tune of Christmas carols out of my head. Mom's been playing them all morning. I like Christmas, but with my head feeling like it was, I could hardly stand any more of it. Dad caught me when I was leaving and asked for a dance with his favorite little girl. Dad and I hadn't danced in years, I don't think. Memories of parties at the Great Northern, with the blur of streamers and buffets and crystal came into my head. The way I saw them as Dad and I turned round and round. He would spin me fast enough to make my stomach flip in the right way, and we would laugh and laugh. This dance this morning was in the living room. The lights on the tree were already turned on so that Mom could bake in the true spirit of the season, and I watched the red and green and blue and white pass by me. I looked into Dad's eyes so that I wouldn't get too dizzy, and I saw his eyes light up and a tear formed and then dropped slowly down his cheek. The spinning slowed and he grabbed me tight, held me as if he were afraid of something. Mom came out of the kitchen and said that seeing Dad and me hugging in front of the Christmas tree was the best present she could ask for. So many strange things happen in life. My life, I mean. Just hours before the dancing, I was in my room, buried deep in a very, very different world. I hope I never have to choose between the two. Each one makes me very happy, for different reasons. I came out here to write my fantasy out, but it's almost too cold and too pretty for me to think about it now. Here and now, at least. I'm gonna head over to the double R and get some hot coffee. Back soon. L. Christmas Eve Day, 1987. Later. Dear Diary, When I walked in here, the double R diner, Norma immediately poured me a cup of coffee. Perfect. I told her I wanted to do some private writing, some stuff for school, so I was going to the booth in the back instead of the counter. Before taking my seat, I picked up my cup of coffee from the counter and noticed a very elderly woman sitting very quietly about two seats down. Her face was buried in a book bearing the name Shroud of Innocence. She turned the page, absorbed in the story completely. 
I saw by her plate that she had eaten a piece of cherry pie a la mode and was on her way to quite a caffeine rush. I looked at Norma, who smiled, and I shook my head like, what a great character. A nice, kind-faced old woman out at the diner for pie and coffee over a good book. I went to the back booth and got comfortable. I was about to get into the fantasy with you, but Shelley Johnson came out of the back room. Leo's wife was prettier than I had remembered. I watched her. I was very careful to study her body when she moved, her smile, her voice. I was suddenly going back and forth between feeling totally competitive to feeling like I had no chance at all over her. Then I heard her saying something about Leo to Norma, something about how he's never home, and when he is, he just wants to get it on. I had won. I felt like a bitch for thinking it, but I thought I've been doing it with it for quite some time now. I'll keep doing it if you won't. I knew that wasn't what she meant, but I couldn't feel sorry for her, or I would never be able to see Leo again. I couldn't deal with that. I watched as the old woman from the counter tried to make her way out of the diner. It was obvious that it was difficult for her, and I felt for a minute like I should get up and help her, but Shelley did it. Norma came over with more coffee and said that the old woman comes in a lot, but it's difficult for her to move. Her walker helps, but she's constantly struggling with each step, as I could probably see. Norma said that there are a lot of senior citizens in Twin Peaks who have no one to take care of them. There is no place to go, at least not without heading into Montana. Most want to stay here. It's quiet. They're happy for the most part. I started tossing this around in my head, a problem to solve. I would do more than just help the woman to the door. Uh-oh. Competitive Lara, front and center. I hadn't felt like this since elementary school. I was fired up about finding a way to help the senior citizens Norma mentioned. I left a note for Norma when I paid the check. I said that I wanted to talk more about helping these people. I told her she could call me when she got a chance. I'm going to try to catch a ride to Johnny's with Ed Hurley. I can see him outside the window. I hope he's going that way. Speak soon, Laura. P.S. It is late on Christmas Eve night. I'll say more later, but I heard about Norma's upsetting phone call earlier at the diner. When I was with Johnny, I heard Benjamin talking to the sheriff or something. I got the whole story after that because Benjamin was upset about it. I know Norma won't be able to call me back right away because Hank, her husband, who I've never really been impressed with, killed a man on the highway last, late last night, coming back on the Lucky 21 from the border, I think. Anyway, he's going to do time now for vehicular manslaughter. I'm glad I'll be away for a while. Norma always seems so upset by him. I'm sorry for Norma, not for Hank. January 3rd, 1988 Dear Diary, Christmas was interesting. Dad took three days off and made it incredibly difficult, without realizing it, for me to get high. I had to fake premenstrual cramps so that he would let me leave and go to my room to be alone. As I went up the stairs, I stopped because I heard Dad say, But it's the new year. I'm on holiday. Why does she want to be alone? I could hear my mother explaining in that kind, so very wise voice, that I was a teenager. Parents are like the plague to teenagers, Leland. We're lucky she even spent this much time with us. She was only out for three hours on New Year's Eve and she was back before midnight to celebrate with us. Mom's doing a great job, so I proceeded upstairs to my room for some privacy and a well-deserved line. A line heals all wounds. Bobby and I actually had a really good New Year's Eve, like Mom said, for three hours, 8.30 to 11.30. We went out to the golf course, where about 30 other couples had the same plan. Grab a blanket and the drug of your choice. Alcohol came out the winner, though Bobby and I smoked a joint, and curl up on the grass and watch the stars. We were away from the others, but close enough that as we were smoking our joint, we could overhear the other couples making New Year's resolutions 
and New Year's wishes on the stars above us. Bobby turned onto his side and put the joint in my mouth. I took a hit and I remember thinking, he's going to say something serious here. I can feel it. He took a quick hit and held it in, looked upward, exhaled, looked back at me. Laura? Yeah, Bobby? I was feeling warm and good. I love pot. Laura, I'm sorry things are the way they are sometimes. Between us. I mean, I wish we were both... I don't know. Bobby, come on. I was listening to you. Go on. I can't speak for you, but I feel like sometimes you and I are so close. Even when we aren't sleeping together, we're just close. I turned on my side and leaned on my head, leaned my head on my hand. We hadn't talked in ages. We were even stoned too. Go ahead. I agree. Other times, I don't know what the hell is what. It's like I'm doing all my life stuff, all of Bobby Briggs' stuff, but it doesn't affect me like maybe it should, you know? I wanted to understand, so I gave it a shot. You mean like, there's a part of you who goes to school, does chores, goes to work part-time or whatever, but the other part, the part that feels things and cares about things, is inside somewhere asleep? Yeah. Yeah, you sorta of got it. But, I'm skipping my whole point here. He offered me the last hit off the joint. I decided to take it and hit off of it while he held it in his fingertips. I love the way Bobby's skin smells. I took the last hit, and he went on. I was thinking that you and I are together just because it's where we'd expected we'd be. Is this making sense? I nodded. I knew what he was saying. I just don't want us to be together because of a deal we made, because of the... I mean, Leo and all the snow around the place. Sometimes I don't think that matters, and other times I think that if you had to choose between the snow and me, well, I think I'd lose. I looked down at the blanket we were on. I tried to see its pattern in the darkness, but saw only the vague shadows of the black and red plaid I knew it was. I picked at the wool nervously. Finally, I was able to look up at him. I told him that sometimes I would choose the coke over him, but that I would sometimes choose coke over anyone. I told him I didn't want to hurt him, or anyone else. I just feel that sometimes I am better company to only myself because of what is happening in my life than I am or would be to anyone else. He told me that he could understand that, maybe, but he wanted to know if I thought the coke was the problem. I told him, very quietly, that I started really liking coke because I didn't have to think about the problem. I told him I liked pot for the same reason. I remember saying, I can't tell you anything, Bobby. I just can't. I understand if you want to leave me because of it, but I just can't tell you or anyone. I knew that the coke was a problem, but it was nothing next to Bob. He didn't say anything for the longest time. Then he kissed me. He kissed me for a long time, and when he stopped and looked at me, he said I didn't know all of his problems either, and that he would try and understand the times I didn't want to jump up and down with joy. Something like that. Then he said that he felt we belonged together. At least right now he felt that. Things were strange for the rest of the night. Not bad strange, just different from the way Bobby and I usually were together. We made out for hours, and then, and I see this with all honesty, we made love. No games, no control, no ego, no bad thoughts, or thoughts about anything except what was happening. It was amazing. Both of us agreed. I knew I loved Bobby at that moment, and I know I love him now. 
I just wonder if I can let myself feel any of these wonderful, pure feelings without getting myself in trouble with Bob. Why do I always, always have to second guess my life and my feelings? Why can't I just love him, fight with him, kiss him, etc. without worrying that I'll die because of it? Why do other girls get to have happy lives? Why can't I just tell him the truth? You don't know the truth. You're here. Smart girl. What do you want? Just checking in. Fine. I'm here. You checked in. Now go. I saw your light on six nights in a row. So did anyone who walked down the street. Laura Palmer, be nice. You never taught me that. Nice. Definition. Don't be rude. I'm to the point where I don't care anymore, Bob. Do whatever you need to do. I don't need anything. How nice for you. Now get out of my head. I want things. I can't hear you. We both know you can. Diary, I am here alone, in my room, alone. I have had a very nice day, and now I am sitting in my bed, on top of the covers, writing to you. I know that I can control this. I know I can see Bob because he is real. A real threat to you, Laura Palmer, to everyone around you. Be nice. Be glad to see me. Never. You only make things worse this way. It's impossible. Get the fuck out of my head. I like it here. Might stay a while. Fine. Be nice. Nice? Gee, Bob, is that you? How wonderful of you to drop into my head. The door's always open, you know? Why don't you and I go for a walk in the woods, Bob? Come on. Let's take a walk. You can pick the day's game. What will it be? Sex? No. You're dirty. You're wrong. Try again, Laura Palmer. You aren't worth it. I have a message. A message from? A dead man. I'm insane. You are not real. It's simple. I need to get to a doctor because I am creating this. I am in charge. Calm down. I have to calm down. Message. A seat is being saved for you, Laura Palmer. Stop. Back soon. See? You are in my head. No one besides you knew the details of the dream of my death. Not even Bobby. Bob is not real. Laura. January 7th, 1988. In the eyes of the visitor. I am something constant, an animal of prey. No matter how many times I am attacked, sent home to the nest, bleeding, I stay. I am the greatest of fools, a defect in the cycle of life. No creature with any respect for life, for itself, its enemy, stands again and again in the enemy's path. I stay. I have no respect left for the enemy, for the nest, for the tree, for the prey. I wait. Without choice, I challenge his threat to take this baby and hand it to death. January 20th, 1988 Dear Diary, I have some good news. I spent the afternoon with Johnny today. He was in especially good spirits, and I decided that the day was too crisp and beautiful for either of us to stay inside. Out to the front lawn we went. 
The lawn is a great expanse of green grass and flowers, tended year-round by a staff of men and women with green thumbs, fingers, and the rest. It is the perfect place to spend a Saturday afternoon. I usually see Johnny on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but apparently a specialist came to see him yesterday, and Benjamin asked if I would mind coming today instead. Between you and me, diary, today was much better for me. Yesterday, for the second time ever, I ditched school. I spent the whole day going through my bedroom, reorganizing things. Mom and Dad were gone all day until 6 p.m. at some convention. I rearranged my furniture a bit and bought a lock for my bedroom door. It was easy to install because it was only a chain lock. A few screws later and I had privacy. If only everything were that simple. I didn't ask Mom or Dad if the idea bothered them, so I chose the chain, figuring they will think I only want the room locked when I'm there. This is not the case, but for now, until I can think of a reason that the two of them would approve of, and not question, this is it. I went through some of the more recent Flesh World magazines and found that this is the time to submit a fantasy of mine. There is a contest going on for one month only. Fantasy of the month. The winner receives $200. Anonymity is allowed, although a mailing address is necessary. My safety deposit box allows me six weeks free use of a P.O. box. I'll get over there later today and take care of it, I guess. No harm in entering, as long as I use a different name. Today, I needed a fresh start. My time with Johnny was wonderful, and, dare I say, almost spiritual. We were lying face to face on our stomachs while he requested that I tell him story after story. The moment I would finish one, he would applaud and say, Story. He didn't want to be read to. He wanted nonfiction. Life experiences. All that went through my head at first was, This is impossible. I can't tell him any of my stories. But eventually I realized that I was, not only did I have some suitable stories, but that I was being far too forgetful of Johnny's mental level. I could have recited the grocery list with intonations like those of storytelling, and he would have stood up to cheer. He wanted to feel included in a face-to-face -face discussion, some interaction, spoken to rather than about. I was able to stop pitying myself and to recall some of the happiest times in my life, as well as some of the most sad. Each story helped me as much as it did Johnny. I had a chance to realize how far away I had kept happiness and how much I missed it. As you can imagine, I basically took full advantage of the chance to just babble on to someone, story or no story, uninterrupted. No questions, no comments, no judgments on who I was or where I'd be going once dead. Johnny is simply the best listener around. I felt very refreshed and even entertained thanks to Johnny's innocent mimicry of faces in conversation. He was always nodding as if he understood, smiling when I would, and at the mention of the words the end, he would put all his energy into applauding me. At about 2.30, Mrs. Horn, who I was surprised to see without shopping bags under each arm and a plane ticket in her mouth, called the two of us in for lunch. When I looked at my watch, I was shocked to see that almost three and a half hours had gone by. Before I could get up, Johnny took hold of my hands and smiled one of his biggest smiles ever. He closed his eyes and reopened them and said his very first sentence. He said, I love you, Laura. I could go on and on about how wonderful that was, both as an incredible leap for him as well as for me. It was the highest compliment I have ever been given. After lunch, I left to open my P.O. box I'm going to have to think carefully, carefully about this fantasy. Perhaps I shouldn't write it in here, in your pages, because unless it was printed, it didn't really happen to me, did it? More soon. Laura. February 1st, 1988. Dear Diary, I've been going over and over my sexual experiences and have decided that it is important to look at at least the initials of each person that I have been with. B. 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 L. J. R. P. J. C. L. T. T. R. D. M. J. C. D. M. M. R. M. D. G. G N 
G-D, L-D, J-H, and several unseen unknowns out by the cabin, T-P-S, M-T, G-L, J-S, M-V-L, C-S, D-M-J, A-W-N, N-S-R, D-D, S-C, H-P-B-E February 9th, 1988 Dear Diary, Something very strange has happened. I snuck out of the house last night to go see Leo and Jacques at the cabin. Renette was supposed to be there too, and I was pretty excited about seeing her. Besides, it had been ages since I could talk about things with a girl. Donna just wouldn't understand all of this. I needed girl talk. Badly. I began walking, but then decided I was too impatient. A big mistake. And so I headed toward Highway 21 in hopes of hitching a ride the next mile or two toward the cabin. About 15 minutes passed before I saw a big rig, just like Leo's, coming down the road. I stuck my thumbs out, and sure enough, the truck pulled over and the door opened. Inside the cab were four very drunk, very drugged up truckers, who, from what I could understand, had been in town drinking. One of them offered me a beer, and I took it, not really because I wanted it, but because I was suddenly afraid of upsetting any of them. I told them where I needed to be dropped off, and just before my stop I finished the beer and began peeling the label off the bottle nervously. I realized we were not going to stop. I told the driver he was about to pass my dropping point, and he told me I should know better than to be hitchhiking late at night with a body like mine, poured into my jeans and t-shirt the way it was. I swear I was not poured into my clothes diary. My only mistake was leaving the trail through the woods and heading out to the highway alone. It was a big mistake, but I... I wasn't thinking. We drove up through Twin Peaks to a seedy little motel that I wasn't even convinced was owned and open due to its shabby appearance, but needless to say, these guys already had two rooms and basically carried me into the first. I caught the room number, 207. In case I could call for help, I would know where I was. I wasn't sure I'd get out of here in one piece. All of them became incredibly rowdy. They were screaming at the top of their lungs and shouting out vulgar language. I thought for a moment that if I could just stand up without anyone noticing, I could outrun any one of these drunk jerk-offs. I was as careful as I could be, but the moment I tried to stand, three of the four guys were on me. Where you going, baby? Hey, why don't you and I go into the next room and do a little private dancing? He was the ugliest of them all. I knew that if I didn't do something soon, something to manipulate the situation my way, They would become violent, and most likely rape me. I realized that I might never come out of it alive. I was horrified. I forced a smile. Listen, all of you. One of the guys looked at me like I was out of my mind to be taking such liberties. He was interested, though, in what I was going to say, because he got all of them to shut up and gather around the chair I was in. I squeezed yet another false smile out of my face and went on. Listen, if you all want to play tonight, and you know what I mean, then let's do it right, okay? One of the guys, the one with the tattoos everywhere, stepped up to the chair and kicked the hell out of it five or six times. I tried not to look as mortified as I was. He bent down, greasy hair in his face, his breath like garbage. You better watch your mouth, little hitchhiker, because where I'm from, a hole like you would never dare tell a man that he ain't doing a job that beats all other jobs. I didn't mean to imply that you weren't experienced. I can tell that you are just by watching you move. God, they're all so awful. 
My tongue was shaking in my mouth, nervous and lying. I was so stupid. Another of the guys, the youngest, and the only one with any concern for me at all, suggested they hear what I had to say. I slid myself back to an upright position in the chair and looked at all of them carefully. I thought, just go for it. It's either going to work, or they're probably going to rape and kill you. You can't let people like this take your life. Just make it up as you go along, Laura. Okay, I'm not opposed to drinking drugs or sex, all in measured doses. I am not opposed to getting a little kinky, getting motherly, or becoming a little girl. More of a little girl, nor am I opposed to performing a solo show. For everyone. There were belches and nodding heads, eight big eyes growing wider. I think all of you will like my show very much. I'll even invent some new things for you. New touches. And if anything should come to you about what you want me to see me do, you come over and whisper it in my ear. I'll play games. But here's the deal. I get a ride back to town, and I walk out of here the same way I walked in. No violence. One of the guys decided he was too macho for this and said, I'll slap you right upside the head if I get the urge, bitch. I gathered my nerves enough to lean toward him and appear confident. If you get the urge to slap me, as you said, right upside the head, I haven't done my... job. I swallowed hard. You can call me bitch and whatever else, but let's just try and get along, okay? It took me another 40 minutes after they agreed to my show to get them to stop with all the attitude and the yelling. Finally, I offered each a Valium and his beer and told them to sit on the couch, drink the beer, and I would start. I have never been so frightened. Ever. Forget nightmares. Forget near misses with a speeding car on a wet road. Forget Bob, even, simply because, in comparison to this, it was four to one, and each of them was big enough to eat my entire body as a snack before lunch. All of them sat on the couch except one, who I told to watch the door so that no one would think I was planning an escape. I pulled a chair around in the middle of the room, a wooden chair, nice high back, almost too perfect. I took a few steps to each side of the room and switched off the lights. Slowly, I began to undress, and each time I removed a piece of clothing, I memorized where I had tossed it, so if they did pass out like I planned, I would be able to dress quickly and get out. I began to talk to myself. I imagined being stoned so that I could relax. I was so damned afraid that someone was going to jump up and say, You're history, baby. But no one did. I slowly began the routine of the little girl lost in the woods, a favorite of Leo and Jacques because I can become mommy so fast. I prayed that I could keep them intrigued long enough to watch their eyelids get heavy. I went to the man at the door, probably the meanest one, and I lifted his head which was surprisingly relaxed onto my chest. I talked to him softly. It was a good fifteen minutes that he was touching me and getting really into talking back with me, and I could feel him giving in just like shock. One of the others got selfish and said, Hey, what about over here? Don't you worry, boys. I don't get tired. I never get bored. And it would be impossible to forget who's in this room. I had to keep all of them happy. I swung the chair around and asked the man with me to kneel down. I told him softly so that it would not appear as a threat, and began to dance, admiring them, anything about them, lying. None of them were passing out. Finally I made it back to the chair. Next began the hottest part of the whole piece, a very rowdy, raunchy sit-and-spin routine, during which all of them leaned forward and looked closely at me as I played. I continued this and elaborated on it extended it. I did all I could think of to get them physically and emotionally intoxicated. Everyone was looking tired, but they were still managing to clap and whistle. To be brief, this went on until three of the four guys passed out, and I was left with one. A big, round dude with a three-day beard and saggy eyes. He told me I mesmerized him. He asked if I wanted to go into the other room. He said he had the key. 
I came up close and asked, What about the truck? Can we do it there? Sure, it's your back, baby. So I grabbed what I could of my clothing, minus the socks and bra, and ventured out into the night, trying to think of a way to get out of this place as soon as possible. I needed to get out, get high, get home. As soon as I was able, I sat in the driver's seat and called him over with my pursed lips. He slid across the vinyl seats fast. He buried himself deep in my chest and I thought, okay, Laura, find the bottle with your hand. There! Don't move too quickly. Distract him and smash. I whacked the guy over the head with the bottle and drew blood. He was bleeding all over. I jumped out of the truck and began running, half naked, so what? I wanted to get away from them before they realized what I had done. I went to Jacques's cabin, hoping he and Leo would be there, still with Renette. When I got there, I was pretty haggard, pretty emotionally beaten. I burst into tears and fell to my knees on the floor. Renette came to me and helped me to the couch. I couldn't stop crying. I was even ashamed that I was able to get myself out of it the way that I did. I felt like the dirtiest person ever. Bob was right. He was so right. I grabbed a hold of Renette's arm and I heard her say, There's blood all over her. Let's get her cleaned up. She's only going to stay upset with blood all over her body. The next thing I remember was waking up in my own bed with a note clenched in my fist. Dear Laura, we tried to calm you down as much as possible, but you were hysterical and just kept asking to go home. I don't think anyone heard us coming in, but if you get caught, tell them what happened. Everything is okay now. I know you were scared. Maybe we can see each other in a couple of days and talk or something, okay? Renette. So there's my night. You would think I'd learn, but I guess I just can't for some reason. I've even had thoughts since waking up this morning about how I could have done a better show for those creeps. My brain actually goes over it again and again like a skip in a record, except that I'm making it better, more relaxed. I say smarter things. I actually find myself thinking of going and looking for them. I must be going crazy. These thoughts are all wrong. I am all wrong. Speak to you later, Laura. March 4th, 1988. Dear Diary, I spent yesterday with Donna, and I realized that we have nothing to say to each other anymore. Sure, we chat, and she talks, but the whole time I was there, all I could think of was getting out of her house. I could feel the pure, perfect little walls closing in on me. She actually took me to her room and closed the door to whisper that she and Mike are going to go all the way soon. They're planning the whole event. Thursday night? I don't remember. So she tells me this and I'm supposed to say, Wow, Donna, you really sure you want to do that? So I guess Donna's getting it pretty good from Bobby's best buddy, Mike. Remember him? The chewing gum commercial? All I can say is that I hope he's good to Donna. I've always thought he was an asshole, but I don't have to fuck him, right? Have fun, Donna. Laura. March 10th, 1988. Dear Diary, I was just sitting here in my room, thinking about Bobby. Maybe I shouldn't have told him what happened with the truckers, because he hasn't talked to me since then. I told him the truth, just the way he and I talked about on New Year's Eve. We wanted to be honest. We said we were in love. I only did what I did to get out alive. Benjamin Horn just called. Mom yelled up the stairway that it was for me, and that it was Benjamin Horn. My first question before even a hello was, is Johnny okay, what is it? He said that I should sit down for a minute. I knew Dad was home. Mom was home. Johnny's all right. What is it? He said that Troy had been found this morning on the tracks up by the border. His leg was broken, and three of his shoes had come off, not to mention the fact that he was completely malnourished. He hadn't been able to find food. 
Benjamin said he was sure it was Troy because of the Broken Circle brand on him. Benjamin said that he watched the border police shoot him, twice to the head. He said it appeared that someone had let him out. He promised me over the phone that he would find this awful person and make certain they knew what they had done to a beautiful young horse. I hung up. I looked around, and everything went gray, black, gray, black. I am so bad. Everywhere I turn, something tells me I am an evil, wrong, bad person. How could I have done such a thing to Troy? If I weren't so fucked up and horrible, I could have gone out right this minute and ridden him, taken the both of us off into the fields where we could have survived together somehow. I cannot believe what is happening to me in my life. How can one day be so unbelievably precious, and another a nightmare? A dark dream that makes me dream of dying, right this very minute. Oh. April 7th, 1988 Dear Diary, Not only do I love my job at the perfume counter, but I adore working with someone as cool as Renette. She always understands when I'm depressed and doesn't get down on me for it. Bobby's speaking to me again, and we date fairly regular, maybe twice a week, at the most, or an average of, let's say, five times a month. But we used to see each other every day. Now in school, we hardly hang out together. The funny thing is, we were voted best couple this semester by the student body. I think we care for each other very much, but we have become ob objects of convenience and comfort to one another, without the love and attentiveness there used to be. We get high together a lot, mostly over at Leo's or out by the Pearl Lakes. The times that we get high at Leo's, especially lately, Bobby pays more attention to Shelley than he does to Leo or me. I figure they'll have an affair if they aren't already secretly involved. I told Leo this the other night, which was a definite mistake on my part. I wish I could always blame the stupid things that come out of my mouth on the coke that goes up my nose, but no such luck. I had to beg him to calm down. I've never seen such violence come up so suddenly. I don't doubt for a moment that Leo has a bad temper, but it was how much rage he felt in so little time that concerned me. Personally, I hope Bobby and Shelley are having a relationship. I don't like the idea of being alone at all, but worse things could happen, and I think Bobby and Shelley are good for each other. Dare I say that Leo Johnson and Laura Palmer are cut from the same cloth? Whatever. Either way, my point is that Leo and I sleep together more often than Bobby and I do, and I know it's the same for Leo and Shelley. Why do we pick up the people we do? Avoiding loneliness at almost any cost. Picking a mate by his work schedule, his paycheck, or his abilities in the bedroom are good reasons. If you're fortunate enough to find a guy like that who's a nice guy as well. Bobby seemed right for me. He was there. He was cute, popular, good family background. And he swore his love to me, again and again, until he finally realized that I cannot love anything right now. Falling in love is like holding a white flag out to your enemies and saying, we give up, we're in love, love is surrender. I can't do that until I know for certain that Bob is really dead, until there is a corpse that I can kick as many times as I please. God, I hope that day comes soon. Laura. Laura.